Okay, let's get started. Uh, thanks for joining us for Tracking Environmental Conditions in a Museum with Hobo Data Loggers. And I'm going to give you a very brief introduction first, and then I'm going to turn the presentation over to our speakers today from the Hunter Museum. First, for those of you who don't know us, Onset is the world leader in data loggers, and we've been um, uh, making data loggers since 1981, and we're located right here on Cape Cod. We have over 135 employees, and we've sold um, uh, several million, two and a half million hobo data loggers. Uh, our logging solutions are used all over the world for monitoring environmental conditions and building performance, and we have a global network of distributors to service our customers around the world. The webinar today will run for approximately 40 minutes, and we'll have time for questions at the end. So be sure to type them into the control panel. Uh, Any time during the webinar is fine, and we'll get to them at the end. We are recording the course today, so um, I will send a follow-up email within a few days with a link to that recording, and you'll be able to view it at your convenience or share it with your colleagues. And finally, there will be a short uh, evaluation, which will pop up at the close of the course, so be sure if, uh, to fill that out if you would. We'd appreciate it. Now, welcome uh, Hunter Museum. We're welcoming Teresa Slokowski and Elizabeth Lay today. Um, the Hunter Museum of American Art is located down in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and they have a wonderful collection of art, approximately 6,000 works. Uh, Teresa um, is a registrar there, and she has a degree in nonprofit management and oversees exhibitions, graphic design, and digital media. And Elizabeth Lay manages the museum's online database. She is also a registrar there, and that database documents and organizes a large inventory of, of collection items. So I believe we're going to start off with Teresa, who's going to um, begin with an overview of the Hunter Museum. And Teresa, um, thank you for joining us from Chattanooga. And it's all yours. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, my name's Teresa. And I would just like to go over the agenda for our presentation. Uh, we're going to give you a brief history of the Hunter Museum. Um, a history of the climate recording that we've done at the Hunter, why we chose the Bluetooth Smart Data Loggers, uh, data logger deployment, the challenges we have uh, with the three with three different spaces, conclusion, and questions. Uh, the name of our uh, um, presentation is Tracking Environmental Conditions in a Museum with Hobo Data Loggers, and this. Uh, presentation is going to take you along a winding path that the Hunter Museum traveled to finally arrive at using data loggers. I want to uh, give you a little bit of, uh, tell you a little bit about the museum. Um, the top picture on this slide is um, a view to, towards the museum from across the Holmberg Bridge, which is a glass bridge, um, glass bottomed bridge that um, crosses a major thoroughfare and it allows pedestrians access to the museum from downtown. And the glass you can see through, you can look down and see the cars passing by, and I guess they could look up and see us if they wanted to. Um, the bottom picture just shows uh, us, uh, the setting of the Hunter Museum and uh, from the back side, from the bluff side. Um, it, we uh, are built atop an 80-foot bluff uh, perched up above the Tennessee River. Um, the setting is very beautiful here, even those of us that live here. And, and there are a lot of beautiful views of the Tennessee River and the surrounding mountains. And um, from the front of the museum, you can, you can view the downtown Chattanooga. Uh, a little history of the Hunter Museum. This slide shows an aerial view of the museum. In the center is a 1904 uh, Georgian mansion. On the right is a 1975 Brutalist building. And on the left, a brand new contemporary wing built in 2004. 
all three buildings are seamlessly interconnected. So you can go from one end of the, uh, the building, the Brutalist building, through the mansion, and all the way over to the, uh, to the new contemporary wing. There are three different architectural styles, which represents 100 years of architecture. These, we, our structure houses, as Cynthia said, 600 works of American art, 6,000, I'm sorry, works of American art, which represent 300 years of art from the colonial period to the present day. Um, our oldest painting is, was painted in the 1700s. We have a variety of media, uh, including paintings, drawings, sculpture, photography, studio glass, decorative art, furniture, and textiles. So we have a variety of, of needs to, uh, to protect them and to keep them safe. This is where it all began. This is the original Saxon Manor. Um, the picture that we have on the screen was, uh, came out of a newspaper. It was a special paper that was done, uh, published in September, on September 5, 1908. And the house is uh, listed in the National Register of Historic Places. The cl this classic revival was designed by Cleveland, Ohio architect Abram Garfield, who was the son of President James Garfield. The first two owners of the building of the mansion, the Paxons and the Hensons, um, were known for their lavish parties. Then in 1920, the mansion was purchased by Ann Taylor Thomas, who lived a quiet life in contrast to the previous owners. Ann Taylor Thomas was widow of Benjamin F. Thomas, who was the founder of the first Coca-Cola Coca -Cola bottling company in the United States. The Thomases had no children, so they brought in a nephew to help them out with their business. His name was George Thomas Hunter. Mr. Hunter never married, and he was a um, supported many local charitable organizations. Uh, when Ann Taylor Thomas died, George Hunter inherited both the mansion and the business. George Hunter died in 1950, and the man mansion was gifted to the Chattanooga Art Association to use for gallery space. They named it the George Thomas Hunter Gallery of Art in his honor. Ironically, he had no particular interest in art, but his name is carried on through the years synonymous with art. A couple interesting facts about the mansion before I go on. In 1923, it was used as a movie scene for lessons in romance. There were scenes taken on the outside of the mansion and also interior scenes. Um, we have documentation that this happened. We know who the actress is and the actors, but we've never been able to find a copy of this film. Uh, the first director and that, uh, lived on the third floor in the mansion. That is up here at the top. You can barely see one of the little windows on this floor. Um, from 1952 to 66, with his two Siamese cats, Nefertiti and Hiroshi. He was the last person to live in the, in the mansion, or was he? This mansion is believed to be haunted and is part of the Chattanooga Ghost Tour. In fact, in 1999, a ghost hunter was brought in um, and he detected ghostly presences in the museum. This slide it shows the 1975 Brutalist edition that, that, go, that was built on the right side of the mansion. Uh, you can see it down here um, on the bottom of the slide on the bottom right. Um, by the 1970s, the museum had realized that the collection had outgrown the mansion and they needed a place to display their contemporary art. Um, a low profile concrete structure was purposely fully built so that the mansion could be kept as a focus. See, it's much higher than the Brutalist building. The new building, the Brutalist building, had a central atrium space that was very dramatic, and a staircase and elevator were installed to, for access between the two buildings. This, this building became the museum's main entrance, down here where, where, the, where the pointer is. 
visitor access to the mansion was eliminated. And I'll tell you a little bit about brutalist architecture in case you don't know. It means raw in, in French. It was popular in the mid-50s to the 70s. Um, the look is institutional, massive, fortress-like, and blocky with a predominance of exposed concrete. And you see that's exactly what we have here. It showcases strength, function, and material. That's the purpose. And if you can see this round area right here that was, was put in, it is supposed to mirror the round portico of the mansion. It's got the same curve, sort of to, to, sort of to make it look a little bit like it belongs together, I guess. This slide shows our, the brand new 2004 uh, construction of our new contemporary wing. It was built on the right side of the mansion. Just they felt that, that they would keep the mansion in the center. This contemporary wing was designed by Randall South, who studied, studied with Frank Gehry. It's a steel and glass structure with zinc cladding on the outside and full-length waterfall windows across the back of it. This became the museum's main entrance, and visitor access through the 70s building was eliminated. So now this is the only way visitors can, can, can get in. Um, kind of as a coincidence, the, the, this wing opened, the museum we reopened on the 100th birthday of the mansion. And now my colleague and friend, Elizabeth Lay, will tell you how climate recording has changed over time. Thank you, Teresa, and welcome, everyone. I joined the Hunter Museum in 1995, and at the time we were using the hydrothermographs, which you see on your screen. Um, we used it to record temperature and relative humidity, and the hydrothermographs are still used today by many museums and institutions. The Hunter had about had two of the hydrothermographs, and we rotated one in the 70s building and the other in the mansion. The hydrothermograph used paper charts and red and blue felt pens. The red represented the temperature and the blue recorded the relative humidity. And it was my job to ro record, rotate the hydrothermographs every two weeks. And it was very easy to operate. And as you can see here on this image where I'm using a pointer, you had to be very careful not to disturb the needle, and it's very similar to a record player where you had to gently raise and lower so you wouldn't disturb the needle. And the hydrothermographs had to be recalibrated to work optimally every six months at $200. I think it was roughly $200 at the time. So it wasn't very cost effective for a small museum at the time. Well, in, 19, I mean, sorry, in 2002, under a new director who was a proponent for technology, he asked that I find a different method of finding an instrument that can measure temperature and relative humidity. And I happened to be looking through a catalog one day and saw the hobos. And I thought, well, this is tiny, and it seems to be able to do what the director has asked. We purchased initially six hobos. One we later found out was stolen, I'm sure, from a child. Um, so we purchased some six hobos and the shuttle, which, excuse me, which you see right here. The cable had to be inserted into the shuttle, and then the other end would be inserted on the bottom of the hobo. The, the information was offloaded from the hobo into the shuttle, and I would, then I would take the shuttle itself and download that information right, directly into my laptop, and I was able to create data logs of the multiple zones we were monitoring. So um, the six hobos were shared between the mansion and the 70s building. So in 2004, the Hunter Museum, as Teresa said, went under a major renovation. And with this new renovation came a new system. We installed an internal climate control system that was able to record, document, and store temperature and relative humidity readings. So soon after that, the hobos were no longer needed. Um, this is an, the image that you see in front of you is actually um, the internal system of our store, uh, sorry, temporary exhibition space and it was monitored by ECI. So at this point, 2005, we no longer used the hobos. And Teresa will tell you next what two events made us realize that our ECI system, the new state-of-the-art system, wasn't working properly. Teresa? Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, 
two things that the two things that happened that you read here. One, um, we requested uh, an ex exhibition, a temporary exhibition from a major organization, and um, the other one was that we found some cracks in a glass sculpture in one of our galleries. This first event was um, the slide. This is a picture, an installation shot of an ex exhibition in our temporary exhibition space. Um, when we requested a lo the loan, the, um, the organizer, the museum, uh, asked us to provide three years of climate control readings in the, uh, where the, in the gallery space where the exhibit would be displayed. Um, we went back to the ECI system and tried to print out uh, three years of data, which should have been easy, found that it was malfunctioning. The, the recording portion was only um, saving or only going back two weeks. And the other event that happened was we discovered uh, cracks in a sculpture. Um, the sculpture was, is installed in our contemporary gallery. Um, right here on the left, it shows the uh, way that the bench looked when it was installed in 1998. And the image on the right shows the way it looks, looks today. Um, of course, we consulted with a professional objects conservator who requested to see historical environment, uh, environmental data over the last past year to help determine the cause of the cracks. Uh, there was a question about whether it was they were caused by extreme fluctuations in the climate conditions or whether there is something wrong with the glass material or the process itself. Again, we had no data to give her. This slide shows um, the back side of the hunter, um, where that white arrow is. It's where the, um, the sculpture is installed in the contemporary gallery. As you see, it's overhanging the bluff. And the curator wondered if maybe the fact that the sculpture was over the overhang might cause the extreme fluctuations in the floor temperature. And if that was the cause of the cracks, if we, we determined that, then the sculpture would have to be moved elsewhere. So the first step we needed to do was to find out if we could re get our ECI system repaired. And we found it was not an option. To repair the recording component of the system, we would have to replace the whole system. They called it an update, but it was a replacement at a cost of thousands of dollars. And the climate control portion of the system was still functioning perfectly. Nothing was wrong with it. So really, to spend thousands of dollars to replace the system, it didn't seem, didn't seem very reasonable. So now, back to my colleague and friend Elizabeth to find out how we solved the problem. I also want to note in this picture, right below with the white arrow, there are a couple of windows. That's uh, where my office is located and Teresa's, and I will tell you why that's an important reason. Yeah, where, where Elizabeth's office is where the, the, the pointer is, the, the mouse pointer is, and my office is next door. <laughs> so we realized we needed a quick solution, and we had such a great history with the hobo. We knew they were a reliable product, and so we decided, let's give it another shot. The facilities manager, Teresa, and I looked, you know, looked at the website and decided that would be the best, best option that would give us uh, some really instant information that we needed. We purchased five of the Hobo MX 11, 1101 with the Bluetooth technology. And aside from its reliability, we were all excited about the um, Bluetooth aspect of it, which you're able to download wirelessly, wirelessly up to 100 feet. So I'm constantly challenging that. And back to where our offices are, sometimes I can sit in my office and retrieve the information from the floor above, which is very convenient. The Bluetooth, um, I'm sorry, the Hobo data loggers run on a smartphone. And we realized quickly that only one person on staff had a smartphone. <laughs> so we decided to buy an iPod and devote it to the Hobo. Because um, I, I have an Android, and I found that um, it's very easy 
to even use with the Android, uh, the app that is offered by Onset makes it quick, uh, makes it very easy for you to download the app and retrieve the information if something happens uh, with another instrument that you're using. I have configured the hobos to record every 15 minutes, and I retrieve the data every two weeks. And one of the conveniences of the hobo is that I can get the readings, view the readings off of the iPod, and email it to myself at that moment. I email the chart and then the data itself. So once I get back to my desk, it's right there on my desktop, and I can archive that information. The, in the museum, we strive, as all museums, to have ideal internal temperatures. Our, we try to have the temperatures range from 68 to 72 degrees with a plus or minus fluctuation, degree fluctuation. The relative humidity should fall around 50 to 55 percent with a plus or minus 5 percent fluctuation. And being in Chattanooga and the Deep South, we are plagued with very high temperatures and high humidity, so we're trying to always avoid the sharp spikes. Teresa will now talk about how we decided on deployment of these five data loggers. Hi, everybody. I'm back. Uh, you are looking at a floor plan of our museum spaces. Um, in the center is our main floor. Um, over here at the, at the right end, where the red arrow is, is our contemporary space. And that is where the, uh, the, the sculpture was, is located that has the cracks. And it's also the part that hangs out over the bluff. Up at the top is the temporary exhibition space. And that is located right over the top of the lobby. And at the bottom, is a mansion. This is the first floor mansion that fits right here on the on the on the chart, and this is the second floor mansion. Um, there's a staircase and an elevator that gives you access to the mansion from the the main floor. Hobo placements for the five loggers was very carefully thought out. We knew we needed coverage in the temporary exhibition space because uh, to, to compile historical, wait a minute, yeah, to compile, compile historical data for future events. We knew we needed one, that, this is the temporary space. We knew we needed one in the contemporary gallery to find out if any temperature fluctuations could have caused those cracks. And we knew we needed to track the environmental conditions in art storage where the most of our um, collection is stored. And we wanted to have one logger in the mansion, in the historical mansion, where you see those arrows is actually where we placed them. Our ultimate goal is to have a logger in every gallery space. Um, the next few slides are going to show you the actual placement in the galleries where we, where we actually put them. This first one, this is where the sculpture with the cracks. And we strapped that logger directly on the pedestal. It's a metal pedestal right underneath the glass bench. We placed it unobtrusively so that um, visitors wouldn't notice it right away and be distracted. So if you're standing, you really can't even see it. Um, we actually, and when we were, our thought process is where we actually decided to try to make all of the loggers placements as unobtrusive as possible. In, in all of the spaces. This next um, image shows uh, the logger placed in our, in our storage vault on a centrally located column. And you can see to the left art screens and art, the art hanging on them. The art storage vault is below ground level, so you didn't see it on the map. And because it's not part of the public spaces. It's down here where the administrative part, part is. And as expected, temperature and humidity readings in, the, in, our, in our storage vault have remained constant. This next slide shows one of the loggers that we placed in the temporary exhibition space. The temporary exhibition space, the logger is up here in the very corner. You can barely see it. The temporary Temporary exhibition space is a huge 
rectangular area located directly over the lobby. The entire space can be divided in two. Well, it can be used for one exhibit or it can be subdivided into two galleries. And I'm going to go back to the map and show you on the map the corner where we installed this one. Right here in the top. It's on the outside corner. And the other one is over here. I'm going to go back. The one on the outside corner of the TE gallery, the reason we chose an outside corner, is we were, cur whoops, we were curious to see if the outside weather conditions would affect the inside climate conditions in the gallery. And the second logger that we put in the TE gallery was installed on an inside wall in the opposite end of the gallery, in the other space. And we wanted to, wanted to do that, to have an inside and an outside wall to see if there were any differences in the readings um, between the galleries. <clears throat> it's very important for a museum to have historical data, a uh, data trail of uh, climate, con climate conditions. Um, the reason it's so important is if we don't have the, the documentation of, of climate, when we go to ask our request a, an exhibit, the lender could turn us down. Also, if we do have readings and they're not within what they consider to be the safe parameters of their art, they could also turn us down. This data logger is the one we put in the mansion. I'm going to point to it because it's kind of hard to see. <laughs> um, it's on a wall in the, um, in the gallery, in the gallery space between the mansion foyer, which is the main entrance on the first floor when the mansion was new. The mansion has all of the furnishings and decor its, uh, decorations and, and everything that it had when it was used as a house when it was first built. So people would walk in the front door and come into this foyer space, and there's, it was a very beautiful building. Um, I, I want to tell you why it's so important for museums to keep historical environmental readings. Um, if a condition change is, is found in something, uh, as for an example, um, a buckling in a, in a work on paper, we have, if we have those records, we can look back and try to see if there was any kind of abnormality in the, in the climate that could have been the cause of it. And when, if a cause can be pinpointed, then we can, we can, it might be prevented and preventable in the future. Also knowing what caused a condition change or, or damage sometimes can help us determine how to have the work cons conserved. Now here's Elizabeth back again to discuss the unique challenges the Hunter Museum has. Thank you, Teresa. The first slide I'm showing you is of our contemporary lobby. And this, you're facing the Tennessee River on the second level of the contemporary building. You can see that we have floor to ceiling glass. It's a very dramatic area. A lot of rentals are take, take place here. And I want to add that our temporary exhibition space is behind you. So when you're standing on this um, walkway here, this, this looking down into the gallery, if you turn around and behind you is that big temporary exhibition space. Here's another view of the same area at the lobby. But now you're, going to, you're facing the entryway right here. That's the, That's the main entrance of the museum. Again, you can see the floor to ceiling windows that are used. Um, with that being said, it, it, even though it creates a dramatic view, it can create a very hot house effect. So we're, we try to make sure that the temperature in that area remains steady. And all the light coming in. Yeah, the incredible amount of light that comes in also affects the temperature in this area. The next slide shows you an interior shot of the 70s building. Now, as you know, this building has a very low roof, so it's almost like a bunker. And the temperature and the relative humidity is pretty stable, very little fluctuation. And this slide shows you uh, the first floor, which is the bottom slide, and then the top floor of the mansion. Uh, it is an historic house, so there's very little insulation, even though it does have a, a brick exterior. 
uh, we have uh, had issues with moisture, and we try to very, work very hard to keep the climate stable in the mansion. So in, in conclusion, what we have found by using the hobos, that here's a, another view of the glass benches in situ in the gallery. And this is Materials used by the artist. Um, at this point, we will need to contact the artist and work with him and the conservator to have the bench repaired, since the hobo has given us hard facts that it wasn't uh, the environment, but more or less the material, the glass material. I'm showing you now an interior shot of our temporary exhibition space of an um, actual gallery opening. And here is a hobo chart I was able to download from July 16th to August 11th of the same space that we just viewed. And as you can tell, the temperature is pretty constant, around 70. Average temperature about 70, and the relative humidity between 45 to roughly 48 uh, in, 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 for the humidity. And so this proves to, to future exhibit. Uh, if we want to borrow loans in the future for um, traveling exhibitions, this proves to them that we have a stable interior environment that we can show them to secure these loans. And it also proves that um, we can have historical data that's available for future exhibitions. So we've had tremendous, Hunter has had tremendous success with the hobos. Um, and there's three points I'd like to say before we wrap this up. If they're very easy to use. Um, we installed it within maybe an hour or two we, after we decided on the deployment. Very easy to configure. Um, we've had these for almost uh, 10 months. Battery life, we found, is about six months. Um, the app is very easy to install. Like I said before, I have an Android, and we have an iPod devoted. One time, I found that I unplugged, I had unplugged the iPod overnight and could not use it. So, in, it, so the next morning, I just downloaded the app within five minutes able to go around and retrieve all the data. So it's very easy to use. Um, so the hobos do also serve as a backup to our main system. The hobos also can provide us hard documentation uh, of our stable environment inside of all three buildings. And we're able to retrieve and track data over time to care for our collection in perpetuity. So that wraps up our talk. Back to you, Cynthia, if you have any questions for us. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I think we lost Cynthia here. Sorry about that. Uh, I'm Scott Ellis, one of the product marketing folks here, so I'm going to jump in. We do uh, thank you for your presentation. We do have a, a, a bunch of questions in here, and I do uh, you know ask people to definitely uh, send some more in. So a couple uh, questions for you, Teresa and Elizabeth. Um, we have something from Joseph here. Uh, how often, what's your recording interval? How often do you take a measurement? I have it configured to record every 15 minutes at the particular space that the hobos are in, and then I retrieve it every two weeks, but it's an ongoing record of okay. temperature and climate. Does that answer the question? Yeah, definitely. Um, we've got a couple other... Uh, now, Scott, let me uh, interrupt for a second. You can set you can customize, as you know, Scott, how often you want to record it. You could be, we've had somewhere every minute, every hour. We just chose 15 minutes. Yeah, that seems to be pretty. In. Is that similar to uh, if, if you were able to get data out of the, um, the heating and air conditioning system? Was that a, a similar recording interval? Yes, that's why we chose it. Okay. 
And we were going to uh, put a chart on, on here of the ECI recordings because we can go back a couple weeks. But we just thought it would be a little, it, 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 the slide just looked very complicated with all the graphs on it. So. <laughs> I, I can completely understand. <laughs> Um, a couple questions on on how you uh, deploy the loggers or, or uh, attach them. I, I uh, noticed on your slide uh, in the historic uh, mansion gallery, you have it stuck to the wall. Um, what, what did you use to, to put that onto the wall? I'm sure you, there are concerns about uh, you know peeling off paint if, if you ever have to remove the logger and things like that. It's got the hobos. The kit comes with the 3M command tape. There are four strips, and you also have two of the Velcro straps. And the air just has to be cleaned with um, rubbing alcohol, and you put it on it, and it does not tear up the wall. So we've had to remove it a couple of times. Okay. It's and uh, the, the other. Go ahead. It's included in the the hobo kit that you purchased. And I guess uh, there was another question here from Chad in terms of uh, when you went to mount it to the bench, it looks like uh, you were using the strap to wrap to wrap that around underneath, or, or uh, how is that being held on? We, we actually had to use two of the straps. They have the Velcro with the hooks and the, the loops on either end, and we attached attach two together and put it, you know, because it was, was kind of wide there at the, at the, at the, uh, where the, at the pedestal. And uh, it worked very well. Okay. Uh, we've got tons of questions coming in, so uh, thank you here. Actually, there was uh, Charles here brought up a, a great, uh, a good question here, and it was something that jumped out at me when we were looking at your data um, uh, from the the gallery. I believe it was uh, there was a couple humidity spikes. Do you contribute yeah. that to? People traffic, or what do you think that that was? One of the spikes our our um, uh, operations manager told us was that the system had a some kind of a hiccup, and it it it, it turned off for a bit. And um, I mean, in the space, um, and then came right back in the space where that temporary exhibition uh, gallery is right now. We have a Monet show. And it's a, a very popular show. I mean, people uh, are, the gallery is always full of people, and um, they lined up the, on the opening. And so, yes, there's a lot of people that, that people traffic that come in and out. And if the doors are left open there to the gallery, I mean, there's going to be radiant heat from the uh, from the uh, uh, the lobby area where you see that big waterfall uh, side of windows. So. Sure. But our system, can, you know, it, 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 uh, what it does is it, it, it will detect that and it will uh, compensate for it almost immediately. So. Okay. Um, I've got a couple questions here that, that I'm actually going to field, which is uh, based around the technology. Um, so there, there are multiple questions uh, from a number of folks in terms of uh, what is the the data logger compatible with in the in the Hobo Mobile app. So in in terms of uh, we are compatible with both iOS, which are Apple products, and uh, uh, Android as well. Um, so the app, the Hobo Mobile app, is available for a free download um, in in both the iTunes Store and Google Play. Um, in terms of when uh, if you want to determine if your existing tablets uh, or phones or mobile devices are compatible, uh, what you're going to want to do is look for a particular spec. Um, the, the Bluetooth spec, what you're looking for is 4.0 or greater. So I know that they've released a, a 4.1 and a 4.2 now. So um, when you look up your specs, uh, you can usually uh, Google those. Um, they usually come up pretty quickly. So if you want to know uh, if your device is compatible or not. Um, another technology question with this particular logger, uh, it 
um, it cannot be connected directly to your PC. There's actually no USB port on it. It is truly wireless. So in terms of those of you who uh, may have been using hobos in the past, um, what you're able to do is uh, you can transfer the files or share the files off your mobile device and uh, either email those to you or if you happen to have Dropbox or Google Drive installed on your mobile device, you can send those there. And then you can actually open up these files in uh, Hoboware on the desktop, um, the standard Hoboware desktop uh, program um, for Windows or, or Macintosh as well. Uh, and you also have the ability to uh, share Excel files as well. So you can, uh, you can manipulate that, that data a number of different ways. All right, let's see what's, what else we got here. So another question, actually, and this, this might come back to uh, the security thing for you guys, Teresa and uh, Elizabeth, is do you leave the, the LCD on? Um, I know we have the ability to turn that off through the software, but is that, is that something that you have on all the time so you can walk up and, and take a look and see what's going on, or is, is that a concern? to you we about that leave, being on We do leave the, uh, the LED on. Um, the guards, okay. as they're doing their rounds, always look at the hobos to make sure they're, they're, they're running and they check them. And so it's, it's kind of a second way for us to, to know that, you know, that everything's well and everything's good. If it's blank, then, you know, then we need to, you know, they, they let us know. Okay. Uh, another another question here. Um, you had mentioned in your presentation about being able to um, download from your from your office, and uh, yeah. So I know the the hundred foot range is is what we state is clear line of sight, but you're dealing with some really thick concrete walls. Can what are you guys kind of seeing in terms of ranges? Well, it's 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 pretty cool that that, that we can download it from our offices, but the sculptures just above us, um, yeah. and uh, so it's not that. Elizabeth stood outside yesterday when we went around. She stood outside the TE gallery, the temporary exhibition, that big gallery, that, mm -hmm. um, and she, she picked up a data logger. She thought it was going to be the one that was in the gallery closest to where we were standing, but it actually was the one in the far gallery that she was picking up. So we don't even need to go in the gallery space to download the information, like if visitors that are there or anything. We can do it from outside the gallery. I don't know. I think we've tried to. Yeah, to any 50 is probably our most. I even, sometimes I don't even go into art storage to retrieve the information. I can stand outside, actually outside of my office and retrieve the data. Yeah, because that, that means we don't have to, to go into art storage. We have to, you know, unalarm the system and you know, and everything, and then come back out and do the same thing again. This way, we can we can leave everything alarmed and set, and not have to open the doors to our storage and download the information, you know, from the hall or from the, the outside our offices. One thing, um, Scott, that I noticed with the hobo um, when I have my iPod, it'll tell you, and all those who are listening, if it's logging or if it's stopped. Obviously, if it's stopped, I'm going to go to that hobo and see what's wrong with it and reconfigure it. But you can tell on your device whether it's working or not, or if the battery's low. One time that happened to me for the very first time, and that was the, the, the cause of why it was not logging. But it will tell you on your iPod or whatever device you're using if it's logging and what it's in the te current temperature and relative humidity at the time. Sure. Do you take advantage of the, the alarm capability on there as well, so setting a, an upper and lower threshold, or you don't, or just let it record as normal? We right now we do not do the alarms because the hope we have the ECI system which has an alarm mm -hmm. built in. It'll alarm gotcha. us if, if conditions go outside of range. It'll sure. al it'll alarm our security manager and um, so all we're all we're really using the hobos for right now is is getting that historical data to use for you know for 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 our, to get uh, to secure loans and exhibits and um, and keep it for our, our uh, care of our collection. Sure. Um, now, this is always a, a co common question that comes up uh, in regards to uh, 
calibration. So is there, I mean, I know that we do offer a, a calibration service and, the, you know, for the most part, the, the relative humidity sensors, they, they drop about a half a percent. But what do, and, and I know the strip chart recorders, you were, you know, recording every six months. Is, is there some sort of, uh, you know, every year, every six months or every couple of years that, that you plan on maybe getting these serviced or, or how do you go about the, the calibration side of this? Well, we we we're fairly new to this um, to this to these loggers, so okay. we haven't had them very long. We hadn't really thought about the calibration yet. Um, okay. Actually, we would we would probably go to onset and you know find out what the recommendation is. Yeah, I think typically you know unless it's a and unless an organization has sort of a stated this is what you need to do, typically I think folks get them, uh, you know, get them recalibrated or serviced uh, once a year. So I know that um, uh, one of the questions before is, is do you just throw them away afterwards? Um, but no. Although you know that if you want to buy more, that would be great. But uh, <laughs> they are completely reusable. There's um, they come with double A batteries. Uh, which are user replaceable. Um, I think it said again, somewhere, Scott, that you can store like 5,000 records. It's very um, amazing little product. Yeah, it's it's uh, 80 uh, 83,000 measurements. 83,000. So, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> so it's it, it's got a ton of memory on it. Um, I, I believe if you log every minute with the temperature and humidity, I think it'll last for about a year. So. Um, one other question here in terms of uh, in terms of the calibration, um, it does not come with a NIST certificate. Well, the NIST is the National Institute of Standard Technologies, I believe. Um, that is a separate service that that we offer. So uh, we can, if you if you do need a calibration certificate, uh, there there is an extra charge for that. So we do that. Um, and again, uh, how how often do the the relative humidity? I guess the nice thing about the the sensor technology that we use, unlike the strip chart recorders, is is it doesn't drift as much um, as as the older uh, ones did. So typically, uh, the relative humidity uh, may drift about under a percent uh, per year. The temperature, on the flip side, those are pretty solid. Um, you know, I've I. I've been here what 15 years or something like that. It's rare that you see something temperature-wise begin to drift, uh, unless there's actually a malfunction with the logger. At which point it goes to um, uh, it goes to an extremely high or low uh, temperature reading. Um, let's see what else we got here. So uh, one of the questions here um, is how do, on, on one of the images that you had, it appeared that one of the hobos were near one of your thermostats. Um, do you compare the data between the hobos and your thermostats to see how close the, the ECI system is, is uh, tracking the temperature and humidity to the hobos? We, we, sir, we of course do that. I mean, we, we, uh, it, we're very curious about it. And they are very, very. Uh, the tracking is the the charts are very, very similar. Um, we are still. What we're doing right now is downloading every two weeks um, the information off of ECI. So we're still getting that information, and we're going to keep doing it for a bit until we get more hobos. But yes, um, you know, we do compare. We 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 love comparing things. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, it's also. I know. Actually, we've 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 worked with uh, with big HVAC uh, companies, and they've actually ended up using the product to do some uh, testing of their own their own systems when they've uh, you know customers may call something into question or something like that. So, um, really good uh, use case there. Uh, another really good question here, and I'm not sure if you're using this feature or not, but um, now we 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 do have the ability to um, put a password on each logger. So if anybody else happened to walk into the museum that had the Mo Hobo Mobile app, uh, so they couldn't access your loggers, is 
Is that something that you're taking advantage of right now? No, we haven't taken advantage of that. I think I don't think that we thought even thought about that. <laughs> I think we thought it was pretty remote that somebody would want to come in and, and find our um, what our our climate control conditions are. But uh, yeah, I'm sure I'm sure it is probably rare. Um, but you know, on the flip side, it is something that you may want to consider next time you. Uh, you download and restart these guys is that um, okay. you, you can put a password in um, and, and basically whoever knows the password will then be able to uh, access those units. And that's a good idea. Um, I guess I'll take this question from Amy. Is there any limit to how many trackers the software can manage at one time? So in, in terms of Hobo Mobile, it's, it's going to see um, you know, basically the, the, the MX, the data logger, those are always advertising. Uh, and when I mean advertising, they're sending out a little signal that basically says, I'm here, I'm here. And, you know, that happens about every couple seconds. And so when you have a mobile device that's in range of any of those, it's basically going to pick up all of them. So in the case here at onset, uh, with all the development that we're doing, you know, at any given point, we could have two or three hundred units that are all within range. Um, it's definitely a little unmanageable when you get it to that much, um, but there are there are certain things that you can do to group your loggers. Um, so when you do go to set them up, you can put them into groups. So um, when you go to sort by loggers, um, if you have a lot that are in one particular uh, area, you can go down and, and sort of uh, drill down into into those various groups. Um, but in terms of uh, when you're actually communicating and downloading to a logger, it's uh, it's one at a time. And then uh, you do have the ability to share a bunch of those uh, data files at once. So let me see what else we have here. So um, another, uh, nope, we answered that one. I think we've got most of the questions here. Um, oh, so uh, I guess when you're working with your data, um, now you obviously, it, or it appears um, that you share your data and you begin working with it in Hoboware. Is that is that what you guys are doing? Okay, and then, and then so, um, so when, uh, I'm sorry, the question just moved on me. Um, oh, are you able to zoom in on, on the data? So if, the, like, there's a couple RH spikes and stuff like that. So, um, you know, to look at the data further, you're, you're able to zoom in and, and zoom out within the, uh, within the files themselves. Well, the files, when I email, I email the chart and the text data, so that way I can pinpoint where the fluctuation begins, because it's just okay. text, right? text, so that does help. I do both files, so that whenever there is a spike, I'll go to the, the almost the actual, well, the day, obviously, and then within the hour to find out what, where the spikes begin. Okay. Well, it looks like we're coming up against it here, and, and uh, we've got the contact information up here. Um, yeah, so uh, do you, you're not on back online there. So uh, I just want to say um, thank you uh, to both Teresa and Elizabeth for this uh, great presentation. Um, for any questions that we may have missed here, uh, we will certainly follow up with you and, and kind of go from there. But our, our contact information is here, and, and we will be sending out a link uh, to the recording and a, and a follow-up email. So um, I'll give you guys the last shot. Okay. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, and, and have a great day, everybody. Thank you very much.